We've all heard of plants that can kill you if you eat them, but have you ever heard of a plant that can kill you if you touch it? Well, then allow me to introduce you to giant hogweed, one of the world's most poisonous plants. Look at it. Its leaves are several times the human hand span. Its stalk is typically two to four inches thick. Its flower head is a humongous disc of rays and spokes, which, when in bloom, is populated by lacy white flowers. And its overall height is typically 15 feet tall, although it can grow upwards to 25 feet tall. It is a monster. Yes, when we say giant, we do mean giant. But large though it may be, what is even more impressive is the size of its list of victims. As every year, without failure, the headlines are dominated by tales warning of its danger. Permanent blindness, third degree burns, ginormous eruptions of blisters and charred melted skin are all symptoms of coming into contact with this plant and its corrosive skin melting sap. But worst of all is that these monstrous burns and blisters are incredibly prone to infection, which if left untreated will result in amputation or death via sepsis. Serious business for a serious plant. And the way it works is by increasing your skin's sensitivity to sunlight, which means that you will get sunburned a lot quicker as the sap completely destroys the top layer of your skin, which then gives all of the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation a free pass to completely scorch and incinerate your now unprotected deeper layers of skin. With giant hogweed sap on your skin, it turns five minutes of sun exposure into 15 hours of sun exposure, and the results are devastating. But assuming that you do make it through the whole ordeal, your skin remains sensitive to sunlight for up to seven years. Yes, a lasting affliction that will have you flare up into blisters and rashes again upon further exposure to sunlight. It is incredibly brutal and it consistently sends people to the hospital every single year. But the key to avoid this is awareness. So we are going to talk about giant hogweed today. We are going to talk about identification and how to avoid it. We'll talk toxicology, the science behind the poison. And then we're also going to talk about the many different stages of giant hogweed development. As whether it be summer, autumn, winter or spring, each stage carries with it a new set of risks. So let's now go ahead and dive right into the deep end and get to know this toxic monster. The full scientific name of giant hogweed is Heracleum mantegazianum, named after Hercules, presumably for its heroic size and stature. It stands tall, it stands proud. It towers over absolutely everything. At upwards to heights of 25 feet tall, it is Europe's largest herbaceous plant. Native to Central Asia, it was first brought over here to Britain by the Victorians for its decorative value in gardens. But it has since escaped into the wild where it now wreaks havoc upon unsuspecting hikers. From a distance, the first thing you'll notice is the humongous disc of rays and spokes that sit atop of the plant. Midsummer, these rays are are populated with a densely packed umbrella shaped bloom of lacy white flowers. Very eye catching indeed, but they will eventually wilt and fall, leaving only behind these straw coloured seed pods. And the main stem of the plant can be two to four inches thick. Yes, incredibly sturdy, it is as wide as a Coke can. Sections of the stalk can be smooth, hairless, and green, but other sections will typically be covered in purple spots and blotches. A very key feature. And, very reminiscent of stinging nettles, these sections will also be guarded by these disgustingly sharp sap injecting needles. Hmm, yes. Not a very welcoming set of features. And the leaves tell of a similar story. An unusually bright shade of glossy lime green, these large compound leaves can grow upwards to five feet across. They are deeply lobed and divided, much like a handprint. They are sharply incised and serrated all along the edges. All parts of the plant contain the toxic skin melting sap, but the serrated leaves and the needled blotched stalks contain the highest concentrations. And fortunately for us, since the plant is so oversized, its features are pronounced and easy to spot. And those right there are the features of giant hogweed. 
And now let's talk toxicology, the science behind the poison. How does it work and what is the science? Well, the short answer is that the sap causes your entire top layer of skin to self-destruct, which then allows for all the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation to break through and burn all of your underlying unprotected layers of skin and tissue. This results in second to third degree burns. Ergo, the 15 hours of sun damage in just five minutes of exposure. Hogweed sap is the saboteur that blows a hole in the castle wall. It is the botanical equivalent of the Battle of Helm's Deep. Without your top protective layer of skin, you will get absolutely cooked by the sun. And that is exactly what happens. That's the short answer. But the long answer, and the more detailed answer, is that it is a sorolin plus UVA induced apoptosis of keratinocytes and subsequent sunburn of the dermis and the subdermis, a condition known as phytophotodermatitis. What does all that mean? Well, your skin is comprised of three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subdermis. And within the top layer, the epidermis, you have two types of relevant cell. You have keratinocytes, which are your skin cells, and you have melanocytes, which are responsible for the production of melanosomes, which go on to transport melanin to the keratinocytes. And it's this melanin shield that gives your skin its natural UV protection, as it is capable of deflecting those harmful UV rays before they can damage the cells below. But now here is where giant hogweed comes in. Within the witch's brew of giant hogweed sap is a chemical known as sorolin, a light activated cytotoxin. When touching giant hogweed, this sorolin is absorbed into your skin's keratinocytes, where it then parks itself very precariously in between the strands of your DNA. And here it remains inactive and dormant for now. That is, until a stray ultraviolet ray from the sun manages to pass through your melanin blockade and zaps the sorolin. This awakens and activates the sorolin, which immediately causes it to snap to and fuse with the delicate strands of your DNA, creating a screaming, twisted, defective, mangled mess known as interstrand crosslink DNA. And this crosslink completely breaks the chain of your DNA, rendering it unable to function or replicate accurately. This compromises the integrity of the entire cell, and as far as your body is concerned, this is potentially cancerous. A ticking time bomb that is nigh irreparable and under no circumstances can be allowed to persist. And so, in an effort to quarantine and contain the spread of potential cancer, your body will order that cell to self-destruct. It will order the destruction of that cell by ordering it to commit suicide. This is known as apoptosis, a cellular sacrifice for the greater good. And this is good because it prevents you from getting cancer, but this is also really bad because now you have a hole blown in your defenses, as these apoptopic cells will break apart internally, losing their protective properties in the process. And as a consequence, this allows more ultraviolet light to bypass and penetrate deeper and deeper into the underlying cells. And so the process continues. Sorolin moves in, absorbs UV, tangles the DNA, and triggers the death of the cell, all along down the line until eventually your entire epidermis is destroyed, which then gives the UV light complete free access to penetrate even deeper into the dermis and the subdermis, resulting in the catastrophically deep radiation burns. Once it burns the dermis, that is a second degree burn. And once it burns the subdermis, that is a third degree burn. And now consider that this could be happening up the entire length of your arm, then it is no surprise that the damage is so severe. And so, in a last ditch effort to prevent any further burns from occurring, your body will flood the area with fluid. It will create a big bulbous cushion of protective fluid that we come to know as a blister. This is your body's last line of defense against further radiation burns. 
as the blister fluid will absorb or diffuse the ultraviolet light and it will also create impassable terrain for the Sorolan. It is the moat around the castle that puts an end to the offensive. The threat and the risk of any further burns has been neutralized for now. So when we look at images of giant hogweed burns, we often perceive the blisters as the damage, but nay, they are more helpful than harmful. They are your body's attempt to fix the problem. The real damage is to the skin, above and beneath the blister fluid. The scorched, burned, swollen, charred remains of irradiated flesh and soft tissue. Coupled with the high chance of these burn wounds later becoming infected and causing really severe problems down the line is what makes coming into contact with giant hogweed so dangerous. And that right there is the science behind giant hogweed poisoning. The sorolin plus UVA induced apoptosis of keratinocytes and the dermal and subdermal sunburn, the phytophotodermatitis plant, light, skin, inflammation. Very simple mechanisms, but to devastating effect. Oh, it's a real doozy. But another brutal and cruel aspect to this condition is that you will not notice it happening until 24 hours later. This process shows no noticeable symptoms until it is too late. You've absorbed the hogweed sap onto your skin, you haven't realised, and so you've gone about your day frolicking through the fields of flowers, all the while absorbing tonnes of sunlight and UV, propagating the sorolin reaction. Nothing seems amiss until you wake up 24 hours later thinking, what the fuck has just happened to my arm? And by this point, the damage is irreversible. Antibiotics, topical steroids, antihistamines and a total arm cast are the usual methods of treatment. But assuming that they do heal and all is well, the affected area remains sensitive to sunlight for up to seven years. It will flare up in blisters and rashes again upon further exposure to sunlight. Nasty business. You're fucked either way. But what happens if you manage to catch it early? What if you happen to know a thing or two about plants? What if you are able to realise that you have come into contact with giant hogweed? What can you do to prevent the reaction? Well, it's real simple. Sorolin activation relies entirely on sunlight. And so, you take away the sunlight and you prevent the entire reaction. And so, the first thing that you must do if you have made contact with hogweed is to immediately cover the area with as many layers of clothing as you possibly can. Take off your jacket, your shirt, your tarp or your ground sheet and wrap the area until it is completely shielded from sunlight. We are talking a total blackout a solar eclipse. Motherfucker, we are talking the heat death of the universe. Levels of darkness. No sunlight under any circumstances. Not a single photon. And if you can't spare clothing, well then use mud. Use anything that you can find to protect and cover your skin. Hell, grab a bunch of leaves and turn your arm into a ghillie suit. You gotta do what you can. And then keep the area covered for at least 48 hours to give your body enough time to expel the toxins. However, it is also recommended that you at least try to rinse, wash and clean the affected area with soap and clean water. This may mean cutting your trip short and heading home, but failing that, wait until sundown and then uncover and clean by the campfire. And pro tip, natural soap producing wild plants such as ragged robins, campions and horse chestnut conker leaves can aid you in this process as their sudsy bubbles will help carry the toxins away. But the main thing above all else is that you keep it covered and keep it safe. And that right there my son is giant hogweed in a nutshell. To be aware of its existence and how to identify and avoid it, and to have a deep understanding of its toxins and how to prevent a reaction from occurring, are a set of next level skills that may just end up saving you a limb down the line. Knowledge of hogweed saves lives, and that is easy game, easy life. Take away its potent toxicity, gruesome burns and disgusting blisters, and giant hogweed is actually quite a beautiful plant. Ginormous, impressive and aesthetic. It is an Amazonian prehistoric looking masterpiece. Something that really wouldn't seem out of place 
in amongst the dinosaurs. But with all that being said, giant hogweed is not always 15 feet tall and strikingly obvious. No, like every other plant, it starts off small and inconspicuous. So we're going to finish this up real quick by walking you through the many different phases of giant hogweed development. It starts off life in the spring as an ankle height bundle of sharp, bright luminous lime green leaves. Upon first glance these could easily be mistaken for thistles but the really strikingly bright shade of lime green is a dead giveaway that this is giant hogweed. Thistles and other neighbouring flora such as nettles are a much darker drabber shade of green. So real emphasis on just how bright and shiny these hogweed leaves are. Amongst all else they stand out brilliantly. But upon closer inspection, you will notice that the stems are absolutely smothered in those signature purple blotches and sharp sap injecting needles. And herein lies the danger of spring hogweed. Walk on through this bundle of hogweed and those needles will absolutely perforate your ankles. It doesn't matter if you're wearing socks, those needles are there to penetrate. So do be cautious while walking through the springtime brush and be on the lookout for those bright shiny lime green bundles of leaves. Fast forward to early summer. Hogweed has a growth spur. It's now typically four to five feet tall, large sharp divided leaves and purple blotches on the stem with sharp needles on the periphery. It has all the token features except for the flower head. In this stage, it is just a bud, an unopened, folded, crumpled orb of foliage, a bit like the head of a lettuce. Inside this orb is the flower head, dormant for now, but getting ready to emerge. At this height, it can easily scratch up your hands and arms, and without that bright and vibrant flower head or the wheel of spokes there to immediately tell you that it's giant hogweed, it is very easy to overlook. And so you must remain vigilant and learn to recognize the budding orbs of giant hogweed. And come midsummer, the budding orb opens out and unravels, revealing the signature bloom of umbrella shaped white flowers. Very easy to identify at this point, I'm sure you know the deal. But come autumn and into winter, giant hogweed will die leaving only behind the hay-coloured hollow husks of the stem. Harmless though it may seem, this is actually quite dangerous too. Because if you've got a real keen eye for fire making materials, then you would take one look at this and think, my god, that right there is some damn fine kindling. It's dry, it's weak, it's brittle, and it's hollow. That would burn beautifully. And you'd be absolutely right, it would burn beautifully, but at the same time, it will also release choking clouds of toxic smoke. Just because a plant is dead does not mean it is inert. Many of the toxins are still active even though the plant is dead. Burning it and breathing in its toxic smoke, or even handling the dead dry husk, could result in some nasty lung and skin damage. And so, if you do ever come across the four inch thick, dead dry stalk of a plant, then just know that that could probably only be one thing, the giant hogweed, one of the world's most poisonous plants. And that's Juju. <sighs> right then, here's the plan. The time is 4.54 p.m. The sun is still shining and the birds are still singing. And so I say that it's prime time to have a little hike around to see what else that we can find out here. Any majestic autumn fungi or tasty edible plants? Who knows? Let's find out together. Yes, yes, here we have yarrow or Achillea miliofolium. Funnily enough, this is an edible relative of giant hogweed, if you can believe such a thing. And another umbelliferae to add to the collection. Incredibly common in the fields and in the grasslands, yarrow is characterized by that familiar array of bright white flowers. It also features slender, hairy stems and feather-shaped leaves. And it is these green feathery leaves that are the flagship feature of yarrow. They are unique and are the most desirable edible parts of the plant. Resembling the boughs of spruce or pine, this feature 
feature alone makes Positive ID simple and straightforward. And you'll need that assurance when it comes to the umbelliferi. Around individual blooms, you will typically find a large spread of those feather-shaped leaves, a vast and shaggy carpet of mossy-looking foliage. And it is this right here which makes yarrow quite an abundant source of food. Raw, these leaves have a pleasant and perfumey scent, but are fairly bitter in taste. They are quite strong in the old tannins, but boiling them will reduce these to palatable and bearable levels. These should be boiled anywho, because being ground dwellers, they are likely to be tainted with the subtle hints of shusau and fox urine. Yes, so those are probably not the flavor palettes that you're looking for out here, so cooking and cleaning them up is a must. Other common names for yarrow include storm weed, soldier's wound wart, and nosebleed. Yes, all things blood related, as this plant was once used to stem and staunch the flow of blood from wounds. Handfuls of these feathery leaves were used as compression bandages, and individual sprigs of the yarrow leaves were placed in the nostril to plug the nosebleeds. Its Latin genus, Achillea, is reference to Achilles, whom in Greek mythology used the leaves of yarrow to cover and plug the stab and slash wounds that he suffered during the Battle of Troy. But outside of mythology, Yarrow's true effectiveness as a bootleg bandage is questionable at best. But hey, if exsanguination is on the cards, then it is definitely better than nothing. But pro tip, Yarrow also comes in a pink variety. Yes, yes, exact same flower, exact same chemistry and elability, just a different coloured flower. Oh, now ain't that real nice oh now look at this little batch of fairy ring champignons yes yes the edible champagne colored mushrooms that are looking a little bit like bread buns just baking out here in the hot sun oh yes that is most tasty with a beautiful cream colored cap spaced gills and slender stems on the surface these look rather plain but upon closer inspection we can see the more salient features for you see, the gills are spaced one width apart, and also curve downward as they reach closer towards the stem. Never quite touching the stem, there is space in between, a buffer zone between the gills and the stipe. Technical term for this gill shape is free, and this is a very trivial feature in the grand scheme of things, but it is incredibly important when it comes to distinguishing these mushrooms from their undesirable lookalikes. For you see, eating field mushrooms is always risky business, as there are many lookalikes, some toxic and some not. We can draw a comparison to the Ajaricus genus of fungi, which is populated by many edible species, but also has many toxic species all within the same genus, and fairy ring champignons are no exception. For example, one notable lookalike is Clitosopy rivulosa. They are the same size, they are the same shape, and sometimes even the same colour. But the way to tell apart the fairy ring champignons, the FRCs, from the rivulosas is by the shape and structure of the gills. As mentioned, the FRCs have the curved free gills that do not touch the stem, whereas the rivulosas have decurrent gills that do touch and do run down the stem. Fiddly business, but that's life. Now then, for those that may find themselves wandering around a post-apocalyptic wasteland, then FRCs would be of great value because these mushrooms are easily preserved. For you see, these mushrooms are quite tough and fibrous, which means that they are not particularly prone to rotting, falling apart or going soggy, much like other mushrooms would. No. All you need to do is dry these out, air dry, and they will keep for months, even years perhaps, because they are the mycological equivalent of beef jerky. And this is due to their tough structure, but also due to tretolose, a sugar within the mushroom, which acts as a natural preservative. So dry these out and they will shrink to half their original size for easy storage. And then when you're ready to eat them, just soak them up in some cold, clean water and they will rehydrate they will swell back up to their original size and return to their former edible glory. So if you ever need to make like a squirrel and stash some food in a tree, then fairy ring champignons are a good source of storable edible protein. Now how about another fungi? This 
time we're looking at Lacrimaria lacrimabunda, aka the Weeping Widow, menacingly named after the jet black watery tears that collect in amongst the gills of the mushroom. With a tan coloured stipe and tan coloured cap, they are finely woolly and slightly furry. A common mushroom, often found in large numbers, these grow quite close together, often in tight tufts and clusters, joined together at the base of their brilliant white cottony basal bulbs. And underneath the cap you will find dark brown gills. Spaced closely together, one width apart, they will curve inwards as they near towards the stem. But they do end up touching the stem, which makes this gill shape add next, but not free. Close, but no cigar. For the most part, these are featureless fungi that would be quite hard to identify, but it's those black pearly tears that really seal the deal. As after rain, frost, sleet, snow, or just general humidity, these mushrooms will absorb moisture, which will then be released at a later date in the form of these dark droplets of water. The tears of the weeping widow. While intimidating in name, these are in fact harmless and edible save to eat mushrooms. So you can cook them up and chow down and that right there is some easy peasy protein. However, this is not recommended for beginners due to this mushroom having an absolute plethora of lookalikes, such as the honey fungus, the inocybes or inosobes, the cystodermas, the saphiorelias, the cortinariuses, and the coernoromyces. Yes, there are many lookalikes out here, some of which are a little bit poisonous. So, this is not one for the plate because mistakes are easy to make. Are you feeling peckish? If so, then why not treat yourself to the tasty, tangy, edible fruits of the salt spray rosebush, aka the Japanese rose hips. Abundant, bountiful, and easy to identify, these are rose hips on steroids. They are tomatoes with tendrils, they are big old bulbous red berries that are the size of a conker. Real simple, to eat them, you must slice them open and then scrape out the seeds like a pumpkin. And kablam! That's a toasty and tarty bit of fruit right there. Nice and easy, no further explanation required. But pro tip though, the inside of these berries are always covered in fine bristly hairs that can irritate your throat if you swallow them. So do make sure that you really scrape them out thoroughly. Or perhaps go one step further and hover them over the flames of your campfire to singe off any of those remaining micro hairs. You can also crush, heat and reduce these down into a thick edible jam or you can also brew them into a tea, which is said to help alleviate the symptoms of arthritis. And there is some scientific evidence to support that. So that right there, that's one for your dear old gran. And fun fact, these are named the salt spray rose bushes because aside from being found in the wilderness, these bushes can also be found growing along the beaches by the sea. And of course, being a rose bush, they are covered in a shitload of spiky thorns. So do be sure to mind your fingers if you try on the back. Rapid fire, what is this tower of yellow? Could it be it rapeseed? Ha, huh, no sir. This here is Canadian goldenrod, Latin solidago canadensis. Oh, that's very nice. Now look at it. Native to North America, it is majestic and it is beautiful five to seven feet tall, with long, thin, slender stems, serrated, spear-shaped leaves, and large, branching arcs of golden yellow flowers. Looking most aesthetic in amongst the knapweed, the young leaves nearing the top of the plant are edible, as are the yellow flowers. And that's cellulose for those, but aside being fit for human consumption, these are also a fan favourite amongst the insects, as they will feast upon the sweet nectar within the flowers, and then lay their eggs upon them, which may sound off-putting, but to others, that's just extra protein. The individual flowers that may host eggs or not are shaped like little stars. They have rays that burst forth. And it is this that makes these quite messy things to eat because these can often get stuck onto the roof of your mouth, which for those with a sensitive gag reflex, that is Gag City. That'll have Farmer John, Six Acres Dad, 
thinking that you're running a brothel out here. So, much like ordering soup on a first date, it is not a very flattering thing to eat. Not a recommended meal if you try and a call. But fun fact, really fun fact actually, after the 1773 Boston Tea Party, in which all of the British imported black tea was thrown into the harbour and subsequently boycotted, let us never forget, goldenrod leaves were used as a tea substitute. Yes indeed, the leaves were brewed into hot water to form an all-American tea, which was known as Liberty Tea, or Blue Mountain Tea. So if you ever get tired of the plain Jane H2O, then why not give goldenrod tea a try? It's easy to make, it tastes agreeable, and if you're an American, then you can also revel in the delight of giving a big old fuck you to the British. And for those absolutely game-changing, Michelin-style winning style points, then why not garnish your campfire cuisine with the fragrant purple petals of the hardy geranium. Typically knee height and fairly solitary, hardy geraniums have five purple petals that are slightly crinkled like a bed sheet hanging out to dry. But if you take a closer look then you will notice that the centre of the flower, the bases of the petals, are pure white like a stellar explosion of brilliant white light, it radiates outwards towards the edges. Other features include dark purple anthers that protrude from the center, and the plants will also have these unique, unopened, pointy capsules that kind of resemble stick grenades, depending on how you want to look at it and how far you want to stretch. Simple features, simple flower. The petals are the tasty edible part, but of course, they are not much of a meal. Being just fractions of a calorie, they really are just there for style points. The gourmet garnish for your summer salad. Pro tip. As poppies reach the end of their life, they leave behind these hay-coloured seed pods, and inside said capsules are hundreds upon hundreds of these tiny black poppy seeds. Yes, like granules of gunpowder, these poppy seeds, which you may often find sprinkled upon loaves of bread, are edible seeds, which are highly nutritious. They are perhaps one of the most mineral and vitamin-dense foods that you can find out here in the wild. They are Mother Nature's multivit that will have you feeling right as rain, and will keep your immune system strong against the pestilence. Now for some Epilobium hirsutum, commonly known as the Great Hairy Willow Herb. Oh, what's so great about all this then? Well, it belongs to the family of plants that just keeps on giving, the fireweed family. It gives us food and it gives us fire. Growing en masse, usually along the margins of lakes, rivers and ponds, the Great Hairy Willow Herb stands tall. It stands erect with long, slender, furry, hairy stems, narrow, lance-shaped leaves, and a bouquet of edible purple flowers on top. Edible flowers that have four overlapping notched petals, and inside we have five short anthers and one long anther. Almost like a flower within a flower. Hmm, very interesting. Like a forked tongue, it wants to lick your nostrils as you <sniffs> sniff the flower. Unlike hardy geraniums, the petals on this plant are numerous. Pluck them all off, stack them all together like a marshmallow, and that is some gourmet campfire confectionery. Interesting set of facts, the great hairy willow herb isn't the most appetizing of names, but it does go by quite a few others, such as apple pie, cherry pie, and codlins and cream. Why? Well, if you crush the fresh leaves, then they will release a sweet, delicate, fruity fragrance, which is supposedly very similar to the smell of codlins, which is an old English word for cooking apples, and that is most pleasant. It ain't often that you stumble across a bright, sunny yellow fungi, but look at this. It is gorgeous, I say. Incredibly eye-catching and most aesthetic. What you're looking at here is the stocky chody Technicolor fungi. Genus and species? Fuck knows, because it is a real shit show out here when it comes to the tricolor bullets. But I will hazard a guess. Let's narrow it down to the ballpark. I say that it is either Xerochemos subtodermis, aka the suede, Bullet, or perhaps it is Xerocomelus chrysanteron, aka the cracking bullet. 
but I cannot say with complete certainty which one. And that's not just a case of cutting class and getting asked, no sir, as these are regarded by many as notoriously difficult types of fungi to identify based on macroscopic features alone, because they are so variable in shape, size and colour. But nevertheless, that's enough of making excuses. Let us just admire a damn fine piece of nature. A cap that starts off hemispherical, but later unfolds into these wavy margins. Its top is covered in a light brown suede looking felty coat, and underneath the cap are those ridiculously bright and vibrant yellow spongy pores. And the chody, girthy looking stipe is pale yellow but turning red towards the base. Like many of the Technicolor bullets, these will also stain a pale greeny blue teal color upon bruising. Hmm, really got a bust a Julex color chart for that one, but anyway, whether it be the aforementioned Xerichemos or Xerichemelus, either way, both of those species are edible. Non-toxic, but not a very culinary mushroom for you see. The taste is rather tough and unappealing, because the pores tend to fall apart rather rapidly, turning into a completely slimy and soggy mush. Not too appealing. Plus, once you start slicing and dicing, everything turns blue. And with the whole mishmash of colours, the whole thing ends up looking like an oil spill, which is delicious if you BP, but yes, it doesn't look great and it doesn't taste great. But if needs must, then it is food. It's calories, it is survival food providing that you can accurately and confidently identify it. But fun fact, assuming that this is a Xerocomelus chrysenteron, which I am strongly leaning towards, then chrysenteron means golden intestine. From the Greek chrysos, meaning gold, and entero, meaning intestine, these are named the golden intestines due to the bright yellow pores and tubes underneath the cap. Well, 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 if it ain't a little bit of chamomile. A big old bunch of badminton shuttlecocks. Fun fact, the word chamomile means ground apple. From the Greek word chime, meaning ground, and milos, meaning apple, chamomilos, or chamomile, is named that way because it grows along the ground and smells like an apple. A mushroom in which every feature is pure white and has an egg sac vulva down at the base of the stem. Hmm, that is enough to make a man raise his eyebrow, but fear not, as this is not the deadly destroying angel Amanita virosa, nay. This is Volvo Plateus gloiocephalus, aka the stubble rosegill or sticky heads. These are special mushrooms indeed in that they are one of the only mushrooms outside of the Amanitas to have an egg sac vulva. A very special snowflake indeed and a colour changer. It typically starts off life with a bright white conical cap, which later flattens out and turns off-white. And underneath it starts off with off-white pale cream coloured gills, which later turn pink upon maturity. Hence the name Rose Gill. A transition highlighted beautifully in this image. On the left we have our bright cream coloured gills, and on the right we have our textbook rose pink coloured gills. Also, you will notice that the gills curve inward, and they also do not touch the stem. They are free gills, much like our fairy ring champignons. Small features, but they can really make or break a positive identification. Overall, it's fiddly business, and its colour changing can be quite deceiving. The only constant of the rose gills is that most beautiful, most narrow, slender, silky, tall white stem and the basal egg sac vulva. And that alone is fairly easy peasy. Coupled with its lack of an annulus, that lack of a droopy skirt, is what separates it from the Amanitas, so do be on the lookout. Fun fact, when the caps are wet and moist, they will turn incredibly sticky, like glue. It is viscid, and that's why they're called sticky heads. That's the pro tips right there. If you lick your finger and touch the cap, if it sticks, well then you are one step closer to a positive Volvo Pluteus identification. When the caps are dry, however, they are silky smooth.
Volvo Plateus Gloriocephalus is the name, but in many field guides, you may find these under the name Volvarilia speciosa. That is the old and outdated name, as these underwent a name change back in 2011, which is a bit confusing, but that's how the cookie crumbles. Now, these mushrooms are technically edible, but you will never find anybody recommending them for two reasons. Number one is that they are said to have an unpleasant or unremarkable taste, and number two is that this mushroom has one lookalike, which just so happens to be a deadly poisonous species, the destroying angel. But if you know your shit, then there's really no way to get them confused. But you gotta have bollocks the size of boulders to get past the what if that's lurking in the back of your mind. A beautiful mushroom, one for observation and admiration, not one for consumption. On the surface, these mushrooms look rather dull and unimpressive. But if we flip it over, then it is a whole nother story. Because that white milk that is being excreted from the gills tells us that this is the type of mushroom known as a milk cap. A lactating, latex-producing fungus. This particular one is the grey milk cap aka Lactarius vietus, featuring predominantly grey slash light brown coloured caps with concentric rings, much like an onion or a tree stump, with beige coloured gills underneath that will often have little white beads of latex dripping from them, much like the weeping widow. There is darkness and there is light. Simple mushrooms, easy to identify and safe to eat. A bit tough, a bit on the cardboard side of things, but if you ain't fussy, then that's big boy easy peasy protein. And here's a fun old fact. The king of this Lactaria genus is Lactaria indigo, a humongous blue latex milk excretor. And going off on a slight tangent here, you may also be interested to know is that there are different coloured variants of Amanita to Muscaria, the fly agaric. The mascot of mycology, this showstopper, can also be found in orange and yellow varieties. Slight tangent, but there you go. And what better way to end the day than with a lovely bunch of death caps? Oh yes, that's the sweet, sweet, rosy aroma of liver failure. Oh yes, let us observe it. A sickly, snotty, phlegm-coloured olivaceous cap, like the colour of something you'd cough up after a good, strong, hearty chest infection. Oh, yes. A bright white stipe with an annulus slash skirt three quarters of the way up. And a basal egg sac vulva. Hmm, yes. Our suspicions are confirmed. That is a death cap. And we got them in every stage of development. The shoot, the sprout, the sapling, and the mighty oak. Death cap identification is straight shooting. Really, all you need is the cap colour alone and the alarm bells start ringing. The annuli and the vulva are the two features that really seal the deal, but quite inconveniently, those are the two features that may not be visible or may not be present at all. For example, in young specimens, the droopy skirt, the annulus, will typically still be attached to the gills underneath, protecting them as they develop. And in older specimens, the annulus may have just fallen off entirely. Annuli are only attached very tenuously. Like a wet paper bag, they really are very prone to falling apart. Case in point, on this mighty oak, there is no visible annulus. There are certainly scraps of it everywhere, but no, it's not quite the picture-perfect portrayal that one one would usually find in a field guide. And the vulva, the sack down at the bottom of the stipe, is often nowhere to be found either. And that is because it tends to get buried beneath a couple millimetres, or hell, even centimetres, or hell, maybe even a couple of inches beneath the soil. This makes life difficult, and this may require you to go Indiana Jones to excavate your specimens. But sometimes, oh my nature, really does you a solid and just hands you the picture-perfect textbook example. Gaze upon its wonder and its aesthetics. Look at it. A beautiful vulva, an intact annulus, and a hemispherical olive cap. Every significant feature is there. And that is enough to make a man go hard. Beautiful though it may be, let us not forget that one bite out of this cap could kill you. Yes, the femme fatale, the succubus of mycology, 
it is very easy to overlook those lethal qualities, much like we're doing now. But for good reason, I say, because today we are going to be taking a few of these death caps home with us. Why? Well, because today we are going to be making some death cap spore prints. You are, son? Yes, indeed. Mentioned briefly before in the episode of Campus Phoenix 12, today the dream becomes reality. So join me as we disregard the warning labels and delve into the deep ends of death-defying deadly works of art. So we're just gonna nab this cheeky fucker and away we go. Right then, no fuss, let's get down to business. First of all, death caps produce white spores, so a dark piece of coloured card is required. Second of all, we must remove the stem so that the mushroom can lay as flat as possible. And once you're done with all that, then it is time to lay the mushroom down nice and gently onto the card. Easy does it. Ideally, you want it centered. There we go. And now for the fun part. Wait 12 hours. Good afternoon. It is the next day and we're ready to have a go now. Being incredibly careful not to smudge the print, lift the mushroom off the card. And there we fucking go, my son. That is a death cap spore print. And now that it's actually in focus, let us take a moment to appreciate just how beautiful this is. It hasn't smudged or misaligned at all. It is clean and pristine with straight lines that are well defined. Oh, we could not have asked for a better result. For those wondering what this is all about, this is a spore print. If you leave a mushroom cap flat on a surface, then its spores, its seeds, will drop straight down, stacking on top of each other as they do so. The end result is a visible print of spores. A print that reflects the shape of the mushroom's gills. Kind of like as if the mushroom was 3D printing itself. The longer you leave it, the more raised and pronounced the print will be. And, unlike plant pollen, which is fine and dusty, these mushroom spores are quite sticky. They will clump up, coalesce and stick to the paper, so tap them, shake them or hang them on a wall. These spores are here to stay. But time is of the essence. We must keep going. We must make the most of our death caps before they start rotting and growing out the walls. So we're making a colourful collection. I'm thinking a nice ghostly, ethereal, ectoplasmic green would go along nicely with the pale, deathly spores. Hmm, we shall see. And also, we're gonna bust a nice pink, because you never know when you may have to woo a female with mushroom spores. Oh yes. Right then, I'll see you on the flip. Yes, yes, you can see from the edges that it is done. The grand reveal? Well, I mean, the print itself came out looking absolutely god tier, very nice and clean, but the colour choice, in hindsight, was a bit of a questionable play. But hey, in the right light, it is visible. It's subtle, it's low key, it's a bit edgy. I'll give that a B minus. And now for the pink. Huh. Surprisingly, that actually looks fucking gorgeous, my son. Look at it, the areola. Look at how deep and how raised the print is. The deep ridges and tall valleys. Not to blow me own trumpet, but that is a job well done. Decent contrast, a clean print, and extra points this time for it actually being visible. That is an A star. But time is of the essence. There is still more to do. The caps are just about on their last legs now, so we've sliced them up and we're going for a nuclear trefoil. Could it be absolutely next level? Could it be that we finally put our F grade in art to good use and show Mrs. Teasdale that she don't know goddamn shit about shit? Who knows? We will soon find out together. And while we're doing that, we'll let these scraps do their thing as well. So join me as we conclude our great adventure. Good afternoon, it is the final day and we're ready to complete our collection. Had to stick a battery on it to keep it flat as they're now starting to dry and curl up with age, so we'd best get a move on. Oh no. Oh my days. Oh my days. Oh my days. We've only gone and managed to smudge every single one. My god, that is absolutely botched. Was Mrs. Teasdale right all along? My god. It cannot be. But as a proof of concept, the nuclear trefoil, it's passable. That's an A for effort, motherfucker, I'll take it. Little bit of a saving grace though, the scraps that I really didn't think much of turned out to be quite bright and beautiful. A little bit smudged here and there, but 
wispy, wavy and feathery, its flaws and imperfections, they make it unique. And so the curtain closes. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for sitting through all that today. I do hope that you have learned a lot. Three days and 17 hours later, we got what we came for. A big and bright colourful collection of Death Cap Spore Prints. With our first being the absolute pride and joy. Huh, upon seeing it for the first time, there was a moment where time had briefly stopped and I could see everything in the universe all at once. Oh, it was a magical moment. And so, what's next? Well, gotta buy some picture frames and then hang them on the wall. But until then, my friends, it's time for me to bid you a farewell and a good afternoon. So, take care, my son. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around, bros. Peace! <laughs>